Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nick Cochran. I'll be reading the scripture this morning. And it will be found in Ecclesiastes 2, verses 18 through 26. And in the Bible in front of you, it is found in the Old Testament on page 478. I'll wait for the rustling of pages to stop, then I'll start reading. <laughs> What's a good-looking crowd here? Wow. Thus I hated all the fruits of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despair of all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity and a great evil. For what does a man get in all of his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days, his task is painful and grievous. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen, that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collecting, so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity, striving after wind. Bless the reading of that word. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have your written word, and we can come together and worship. Lord, this is about you. We lift you up. Father, we thank you for those who are here today. We pray for those who are not, for whatever reason, Lord, may be illness. May I know there's some that are traveling. Pray for travel mercies for those. But Lord, this morning, I pray that you will make us like soft clay in your hands and that you will mold us, shape us, and make us into the will of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I know you're probably reading there this morning for the service, right? Not a typical book uh, that we're in, but um, we're gonna we're starting a new series today. the The PowerPoint clicker is gone. I need that. I can't tell if there's uh, something wrong with this clicker, or there's somebody that just wants me to have a hard time with the PowerPoint every week. There's something with this thing that we're dealing with. So anyway. <laughs> We're starting uh, a new series called Don't, Don't Waste Your Work. Uh, and so the next three weeks, uh, it's going to be very practical uh, in our lives because all of us work, whether we're working a job uh, for income or whether we're working at something at home or whether you're a student and you're at school doing school work. We all work in some form or fashion with something. And so we're going to be looking um, at working and not wasting our work and this morning uh, the focus is how work is worship we don't tend to see work as worship we tend to see you know we a lot of times we call when we come in and we sing songs praise and worship um, but worship is much more than singing songs and the bible actually doesn't call singing songs worship it calls it praise it's worship the word actually means to serve uh, and so as we think about working and worship and worship being meaning to serve, to serve God, uh, we'll see where those come together uh, here this morning. So all of our life should be an act of worship to God. And we're going to see how our work uh, as well is worship. We tend to think of worship being a spiritual thing. In America, our Western mindset, we tend to look at our lives like a, a set of, of drawer, like your drawers, you know, your... Uh, your chest of drawers, where you put your clothes and things. Uh, we tend to, you know, we have a drawer for our faith. We have a drawer for our work. We have a, a drawer for our hobbies. And we tend to segment our lives. Um, but when we look at what God says, all of our life 
uh, is about worshiping God. Everything that we do flows out of our relationship of, with Christ and our worship of God. God does not allow us to segment our work from our faith. It doesn't work that way. In America, we have that kind of mindset, but God does not. The Bible does not. So everything in life, everything you do, uh, how you spend your time, your money, how you, the hobbies you do, everything, God sees it all, and it's all to be worshipped to him. Uh, and so we're going to look at how our work does that. So think about a cemetery. Most of you probably know where that is here in Marion. Um, it's walking around there this week can see I took this picture a couple days ago beautiful day nice weather it's been nice nice time to walk but you know as you're walking around a cemetery you notice a few things if you're looking right like there's lots of tombstones everywhere especially this one there's a lot there's some from the 1700s uh, in this uh, tombstone there's dates from the 1700s and one of the things you notice on every tombstone is there is a date of birth and then there's another date right and what's that date? The day of death. You know, and, and this morning sitting here, none of us know when that is. Probably most of those people, 99.9% .9 of those people, they didn't know when that day was either, did they? And it's interesting that as, as you look at that, you know, as walking around, you've got people that are teenagers that are there that have died. You have people that are in their 40s and 50s. You have people that are 80s, 90s, and beyond. And then you even have some children, right, that are there. Uh, and so, you know, your age doesn't matter. You know, you see some of these, it's an interesting thing, you know, like President Harding's memorial's there, and, you know, it's a huge memorial, and you see people that have very extravagant tombstones, right? And then you see some that are just a block, and that's it. And we're going to see here, Solomon has something to say about that, but as you look at, you know, as you think about a cemetery, one of the things that we realize is that death is the leveler of all people, right? It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter what your race, economic status is. It doesn't matter where you've come from. We're all going to face death, aren't we? And what's interesting is what happens between those two dates on that tombstone matters to God. That hash mark in between, whether you have 10 years or whether you have 80 years or however many years or between those two dates, that hash mark, that means something. That hash mark is what you did while you were on this earth. And that matters to God. This, this, in our society today, we have this thing coming, you know, it started with um, everybody gets a trophy. You know, you, you, if, you, if you're on the team, you get a trophy right? That's where it started years ago, you know, or I remember watching a movie and the guy was, he was all upset because he was a he loved baseball and he went to his grandson's baseball game and they didn't keep score. And he's like, why are you playing if you're not keeping score, right? And he was all upset about it because, you know, in the olden days, you kept score about everything. But in our society today, we have this thing, it's not just equality, which equality is everyone should have an equal opportunity. And, that, and that's a great thing. But we've pushed it beyond to everyone not only has equal opportunity, but everyone should end up the same. We should start, have the same opportunity, and it doesn't matter what you do or how much you succeed or how much effort you put in, we shouldn't be any further along than anybody else. We should all end the same. And that's where our society is going. That's socialism and communism. That's where, that's where it's headed. That's what, what's being pushed. There, there's something about that as we think about that hash mark between those two dates that that's not how God sees our lives. And think about evolution. If I'm an accident and there's nothing after this life, then why not just eat, sleep, party because I'm going to die and it doesn't matter how I live anyway, right? Why not in what we see in America today, why not with you know, many young people say, I'll just let the government take care of me right? If, if I'm an accident, there's nothing beyond this life, my life doesn't really mean anything, there's, there's no, no accountability, why not live how I want and let the government take care of me? Why in the world would I work? And why would I work hard, right? 
if you're from an older generation, and I think about my grandfather who was fought in World War II, the World War II generation, you know, people still see that generation as one of the greatest generations that America has ever known. And you talk about some workers, they worked hard, and they sacrificed, right? Uh, and they fought for our, our nation in World War II and for, through some horrific things. Um, so when we think about work, and we think about what we see in our society, and we think about that we're all going to face the thing called death and that hash mark between our two dates, uh, why work? Is it really that important? It, does it really matter to God? And what does it matter for my life? So in Ecclesiastes 2, King Solomon addresses this. And, you know, as, you, as, you, as we look through this, you're going to see a few things that he addresses. And he looks at this whole thing of, of kind of what we're, people are looking at in our society today about status in life or possessions. Um, you know, what's the big deal with working? So why would we work? Well, look with me in chapter 2, verse 12 to 17, because Solomon says, well, everybody's going to die, and it doesn't really matter what their status is in life. Look at verse 12. So I turn to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what's already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly, and light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both the fool and the wise men. Then I said to myself, as the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity, for there's no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise men and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after the wind. So Solomon goes, you know, he was the wisest man besides Jesus that's been on the earth and, he, you know, had a huge kingdom, all kinds of gold. I mean, we, a lot, you know, even secular people have made movies about King Solomon and all his treasures and wisdom and gold. But he comes to this place and he goes, I've worked hard. I've walked in wisdom. I tried to live a life of wisdom. And yet here's a fool who doesn't care about anything, has no wisdom at all, doesn't care, walks in wickedness, and we're both going to die. And we're both going to be the same. And he's like, I'm mad about that. that that's not right. That's not fair. And so he, he comes with this thing of no matter what your what, who you are in life, your status, no matter what your status is, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> right? He doesn't win. He still dies. That's what Solomon's saying here, and Solomon's mad about it. He's like, that's not fair. Why should that be? Solomon realized that no matter how you live, wise or foolish, you still face death. And he said, this is like striving after the wind. And it made him mad. And then he goes into the next thing, the insanity of possessions. So look with me. In, uh, this is in chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And we'll start in verse 9. But he, in verse 1 through 8, he goes through all this stuff that he's done, all these possessions. He said, you know what? Whatever my heart wants, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get it. I'm, he had all the wealth. He could do what he wanted. So everything he wanted, he said, you know what? I'm going to use no restraint. I'm going to get whatever I want. And then in verse 9, he says, Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem, including King David, his father. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities, which my hands had done, and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. So he, gets, he attains all this wealth, and then he realizes it's vanity. I mean, think about it. How many super wealthy people are depressed? Some of the most wealthy people that have ever lived have committed suicide and been some of the most miserable people that have ever lived. And, you know, we would look at that and go, what's the deal? You can do whatever you want, right? 
And yet, they could have whatever they wanted. You know, they didn't have to live paycheck to paycheck or, you know, worry about getting this or that. They just, whatever they want, they do it. I mean, there's a lot of people in America like that. And yet, there's a lot of those people are super miserable people. I remember uh, one, one of the, a guy, I have a friend, uh, he's actually working with Encompass now, but uh, he was a dentist, really wealthy guy. And he's around my age, uh, but back probably 15 years ago, he went to the Philippines. And if you've ever been to the Philippines, super, super poor. Um, and there's parts of it that, you know, there's vast thousands that live in trash dumps. But he goes out into, um, out into the mountains, and he's helping this village. And the people there, they take a roof off their own hut to make one for him and the other Americans that were coming. So they go with, you know, and it rains over there. And they have wind and rain and weather. But they took the roof off of their own because they didn't have another one. And they made this hut for them. And he said the poverty of the people was overwhelming. And he said, but I've never seen and experienced a people more full of joy than those people. And as they would meet together for praise and worship, the excitement, the joy, the happiness in those people, he, it changed his life. That's why he's working with Encompass now. He went there, and he, he said, I have all this money, I have a great job, a big home, and I fight depression. And I come over here with people who have nothing. They have to take their own roof off their house so I can have one. And they are full of joy and peace and are excited about Christ. And he said, it changed my life. And isn't that interesting that, you know, here's Solomon with anything he wants, and he realizes you know, it doesn't really matter. It's like striving after the wind. You know, it's like a sports team that wins a championship, and then they don't go, well, we won one, so that's great. We don't have to do that anymore, right? I mean, it's like, well, let's win next year. It's always the pursuit of something more. I need bigger, better, or do it again. And many people that have won, you know, like gotten to the top of where it is in the sports world, they go, well, now what? You know, and Michael Phelps, you know, all the, the gold medals he won. Then he struggles with drugs. Why? Because he attained all he could attain and realized it's empty. It, it doesn't fulfill. It doesn't last. And that's what Solomon is telling us here. And so as we think about why work, because your status doesn't matter, possessions, it's insanity to, to trust in your possessions. And I had a good example of this this week. This is me and Tom. Uh, so we're in this house over on Silver Street, tearing this house down. Me and Justin and Tom. Um, we got a lot dirtier than that. Because, you know, you pull it off these walls and there's all that, you know, that insulation that's like, you know, 80 years old or whatever. It's, it's really nasty. And the wind was blowing in our face. So it was super dirty. But, you know, as I we're tearing this home down, you know, we found this comic book from 1966 and we find these newspaper and these things are in the wall like they're inside the wall um, I'm not sure why they were there newspapers from the 60s and you know you're looking at this and, I, and I'm thinking while we're pulling all this down this used to be a really nice home this thing was brand new and, and it smelled new and it was a great home and, and then here we are tearing it down and it's just trash and there's, you know, you find, we find, found Christmas ornaments, and I mean, we found little toys, and we found a, a VHS tape. A lot of you don't even know what that is, do you? <laughs> right? And it was on baseball, you know, and, and so you're finding all these things, and you know, and I'm, I'm going through this and just thinking, man, and, and thinking about this message and going, you know, all of our stuff that we pursue and that we, we give ourselves to, it's all empty. You know, you think about a home or you think about a car, you know, and I mean, you know, when you go to, when we lived in Maryland, you know, they, the, the, you couldn't drive a car with rust on it. If it had rust, it doesn't pass inspection. There's no cars with rust in Maryland where we were. Here, there's cars with all kinds of rust, right? <laughs> I think some of them are duct taped together, <laughs> you know, holding them together. My dad actually, my parents live in Arkansas, and he actually, there was a car, took a picture of, that it was duct taped together because they don't have any inspections there. 
You know, and, and so, but you think about those cars were brand new. Those were like top of the line. And now they're just rust buckets, right? Or, or this home that's just filth. And yet it used to be new. And we realize exactly what Solomon is saying here. To work for possessions is insanity. Because it's empty. It's striving after the wind. And then he talks about the insanity of working. So look with me. This is what uh, was read, that Nick read here in verse 18 to 23. So look what he says again about working. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, okay, because he realizes I'm going to die just like the fool, for which I labored under the sun. For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And look what he says. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, for which I've labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor, which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he gives his legacy to one who's not labored with them, this too is vanity and a great evil. So Solomon says, here I've worked all this time, and I've labored, and I've sweat, and I've used wisdom, and I've, and I've used discernment, and I've worked at this, and I've accumulated all this wealth, and when I die, I'm going to give it to somebody and they could be a complete fool and not care anything about what I did to get this and how God blessed me to have this and just totally waste the whole thing. You know, it's, it, it reminds me of, you know, um, my uncle was Sam Walton's doctor. Remember Sam Walton who started Walmart? And he drove an old beat-up truck. You would never know this guy was the owner of Walmart that started it. But his sons, they bought $100,000, $200,000 cars. There's, there's a big difference in the two, uh, in the wealth that Sam Walton worked so hard to get, and, and then people that after him didn't use that same discretion. And, and that's what Solomon is saying here. You know, I've, I've worked and done all this, and, you know, and maybe you've known people like that that have given away uh, wealth or inheritance to somebody who just blew it and didn't care about what had been sacrificed to have that. And that's what Solomon is saying here. I have no control over who's going to get what I've worked so hard to get. And he said, that's not fair. <laughs> it's not only vanity, he was mad about it. And he said, it's basically, this is insanity, realizing that he had worked all this to attain all this stuff and knowing somebody could just go and blow it. And isn't that what happened in Israel? Isn't that what happened with King Solomon? His sons... They did not follow the Lord. They did not walk in wisdom, and they totally blew everything that he had built and accumulated. And so that's why he says here that this is vanity. So think about this. No matter your status in life, no matter what you've attained or how hard you've worked, in the end, you can't take it with you. It's like Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, naked you come into the world, naked you leave. You know, I've said this before. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, Right? You can't take it with you. And so why work? Why labor at all? Well, look at Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24. There's nothing better for a man than to eat, drink, tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? For to a person who is good in his sight, in God's sight... He has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he's given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give it to one who is good in his sight. So think about this. Solomon says here, work is meaningful to one who is good in God's sight. To one who's good in God's sight, look what it says, that he gives him wisdom, knowledge, and joy to one who's good in God's sight. So the sinner's work, God says, is vanity. And why is it vanity? Isaiah 64 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. So if you're a sinner, if you're not one of God's people, all of the righteous deeds, all of the good things that are done by man, God says are like a filthy garment. They're, they're a stench. And all of us wither like a leaf. Right? We're all going to die. And all our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. 
And so here Solomon says it, Isaiah says it there, that though the unrighteous, the sinner, his work is vanity. But here we see that Solomon says the righteous are given wisdom, knowledge, and joy by God in their work. So the question is, who is good in God's sight, right? Wouldn't that be a logical question? Well, if that's who God gives joy to in work, and it makes it meaningful, who's good in his sight? We know from Romans 3.10, how many are good in God's sight? There's none good, not even one. Well, then how does this work? Well, we just came away from Easter, right, a couple weeks ago. Wasn't that long ago. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. Of ourselves, just like this passage, all of us are unrighteous, unclean. All our good works are like a filthy garment. But that's why Christ came and died on the cross to pay for our crimes, our sins, and rose again to give us new life that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So if you are in Christ, God sees you as good, not because you're good and you do everything perfect, but because Jesus is good and you're in Christ. Does that make sense? Because of Jesus' goodness, if you're in Christ, God sees you as good. That's who we're talking about Solomon saying who is good in God's sight. So work is given to us by God for his glory. God makes us good in his sight and then our work transfers from being vanity to being good. Think about Genesis chapter 2 with Adam before Eve. When God made creation... What did he tell Adam to do? You, I want you to get a big screen TV and a nice lazy boy and just chill and just not do anything. Just be lazy, right? Just entertain yourself. He gave him a job. He said, I want you to work, cultivate the land. And I want you to name and take care of all the animals. So work... Before there was sin, and even before God gave Adam a helper, he called Adam to work. But work did not become labor until Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned and God cursed creation. Then work became labor. Before that, work was done for the glory of God. God gave Adam a job to cultivate the Garden of Eden and to take care of the animals to bring glory to the Creator who made it. Right? Does that make sense? That's what he did. Now turn with me uh, in your Bibles to John chapter 5. John 5, verse 17. Jesus says, but he answered them, that's Jesus, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. So does God work? Yeah. He created everything. Remember six days he worked, and then he rested on the seventh. And here Jesus says, my father's at work. And he says, I'm working. And look at verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. This is Jesus. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. Why did Jesus do the works the Father gave him to do? For the glory of God. He says that. Father, I've done all you've commanded me to do. Glorify your name. Jesus, in his time on earth, his utmost first thing that he was doing, his focus before us was the glory of the Father. He worked to glorify the Father. That's what he said. His works testified that the Father had sent him and that he was bringing glory to the Father, to God the Father. So Adam 
worked to bring glory to God. Jesus worked to bring glory to God the Father. Isn't that what it says? So what about us? In, in um, Ephesians 2, look what it says in verse 8. And remember, work is joyful to those good in God's sight. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his what? Workmanship. Is God at work? Yeah. And some of us, he's got to work harder than on others, right? Right? Oh, Tom's not in here. I was going to say Tom, but he's not in here. I think God works overtime with Tom, right? Michelle's here. She knows. She can testify to that, right? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. That doesn't just mean sitting in a chair singing a song, right? It doesn't mean just, you know, sitting in a service or if there's some church thing going on, that's a good work. It is, but there's more to it than that, isn't it? We're created in Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would do what? Walk in them. That we would do the work that God had call, has called us to do. So... Think about this. God saves us, and he has work for us to do. That make sense? Adam had work. Jesus had work. God saves us through his grace, and he gives us work to do. And that's not just spiritual things as we in America would, you know, like I started out with, we tend to segment things. To God, everything is sacred and everything is a spiritual thing. To us, we kind of put these things in compartments. So God saves us and he gives us work to do. Does this passage tell us that work saves us? Right? It doesn't save us. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. So listen closely. Your work is... And the things you do on this earth cannot gain you favor with God. Does that make that clear? I mean, I want to be really clear because that's an important thing that we understand today in America. Was, there's a lot of people who like to work still. But Jesus says, God says in his word here, your works cannot gain you favor with God. So why do we work then? Because we have the favor of God. See, when you're saved by grace and you're pulled out of darkness and you're made a child of God, the favor and love and grace of God rests on you. Not because you've done anything. Right? That's what it means to be saved by grace through faith. There's nothing that you have done or will ever do that will ever gain God's favor in any way. God does not look and say, oh, wow, you really worked hard this week, so I'm going to love you more. Or, wow, you got a really great job, so I'm going to love you more. That is not at all what God says. You have all of God's love and all of his mercy and grace and kindness and favor when you are in Christ the moment you are born again. And so our works do not do anything to, for God to love us more. But we work because we are loved by God. Because we have that, we now, in, in our God who loves us and has rested his favor on us and his mercy, he said, I have work for you to do. And out of love and grace, we work as an act of worship because of what God has done to save us. Does that make sense? You see the difference it's like when I was talking to a, a uh, Jehovah's Witness, and he, he had been one for over 40 years, and he said, look at all the things I do. I go to door to door, and I do all these things, and I talk to all these people, and I said, here's the difference between you and me. You are doing that to try to earn God's favor. I do those same things. I tell people about Christ. I do things to, to honor the Lord, but I do it because I already have his favor. It's an outflow of love. It's not trying to gain anything. 
And that's what the writer of Hebrews tells us. Because we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we offer up to God an acceptable service with gratitude. We work as worship because we're thankful to God because he has rescued us and his favor rests on us and he loves us no matter how good or bad we happen to be that week. Because we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace. Your love is not, God's love for you is not based on your performance. It's based on what Jesus did on the cross and that he testifies before the Father and prays for you now. So we are his workmanship. He's given us these works. That includes your job. That includes taking care of the kids. Or ladies, if you're you know, at home and kids are making a mess and you're cleaning up, that includes that. Or kids, you know, teens, or you're at school, your, your schoolwork. I know that's not, you don't really see that as worship, but it is. Everything in our lives matters to God and how we do those things. I'll give you an example. When I was in college, I had to clean toilets. And a doc, you know, I, I worked for this guy, and he cleaned these doctor's offices. And man, it was sometimes it was nasty because of stuff. I mean, I remember one time I found this on the floor. There was this thing, and it had this blood on it, and it was a big tick, like this big. I mean, huge green tick, and it was just bloody, and it was it was really gross. And I'm thinking, that was on somebody. <laughs> and they had to get it off, right? And it, so it wasn't always a really fun job to do. And I'm, you know, cleaning up other people's filth. But I had to think, you know, and I remember doing that going, okay, I'm doing this for the glory of God, right? It, it was not very glorious. But whatever we put our hand to, because we are the people of God, our lives are an act of worship. Worship means to serve God. And that's what it says in Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, because of Romans chapter 1 through 11, which is the gospel, the grace that God's given us, Paul then goes, therefore, because of God's mercies, I, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies, your bodies, as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of what? Worship. Notice it says service of worship. Worship is an action. It's something that we do for the glory of God because we love him and we adore him and are, we're giving our lives to him. That can be singing. That can be preaching. That can be loving your wife, men. Wives respecting your husbands. That can be doing something for a neighbor, an act of kindness. All of those things we're offering up to God. Lord, here's my body. Then the word means your physical body. Here's my life. Here's everything I do that I'm giving it to you. I'm acceptable because of Christ. And this is an act of worship. That includes our jobs. So... Because of God's great love in Christ to save us, we offer up our bodies and our lives in worship. The work that we do is an act of worship. So think about how does this change then for us as a Christian, as God's people? What's the focus of our work? I mean, why do you, if you have a job, or if you're in high school and you want to get a job, why? Why? Is it so you can get money, which we got to pay bills, right? I hate bills. Anybody else hate bills besides me? I hate when the bills come in, right? And we have to work and we have to have income to pay our bills, to buy food, right? right? So the water bill, the water's not shut off, so we have something to drink, right? So, yeah, we have to do that, but is that the focus of our labor? Is that the focus of why we work? To get money. So I can have this, or is the focus of my work, I serve the living God. And he has me as a janitor, or he has me as a pastor, or he has me as a welder, or whatever you want to be. 
or whatever God has you in. See, when you're God's, your focus shifts from I work for me to here. My work is an act of worship, whatever that is, whatever I put my hand to, because I belong to him. The way we work is excellence. I mean, if the president, even if you don't like him, was going to come to your home, would you show him some respect? And God tells us to show him respect, right? He doesn't say if you like your governing authority, then be nice to him. He doesn't say that. It says to honor those in authority over you, to pray for them. If, if somebody of great status and, and wealth and power was going to come to your home, you think he might clean it up or make sure everything was good? You know, or, or if you're going to go to that person, there's going to be some like reverence, right? Because of the position of that person. Well, think about what we do for God. That's why I'm, a, I'm big, and, and you can ask Dale and Bob on this, when we talk about things that we're doing in the church, they need to be done with excellence. Because this is about the glory of God. That's why throwing things together and, you know, just let's just throw something together, we don't do that. we got to make sure that whatever we do, we do it with the very best that we can do, not as a performance, but as an act of worship because we are worshiping the living God. And we need to be the best that we can be at whatever we do. If you're a musician, be the best you can be. If you're a pastor, I should be the best that I can be. Not so I have high status or, wow, what a great pastor, but because I work and worship the living God. And if you're a teacher or if you're a you know, physical therapist or in the medical field or, or you're working at a grocery store or digging a ditch, we do it with excellence. There should be a stark difference between God's people and those who are not in how we labor, how we work. We should do things with excellence because we're the people of God. And we, if I'm, you know, working at a home or building something or, you know, the picture I'm tearing down a building. That's a lot more fun than building one, I think, to tear it down. It's, it's pretty fun. You know, but I'm going to do my best at whatever I'm working at because my work is an act of worship. Does that make sense? Do you, and you, do you see that that's why, there, and there's times that Christians get a bad rap, and rightly so, because we're shoddy in our work. That shouldn't be. Whatever we do, we should do our best, not so people go, wow, aren't you great, but because we are reflecting everything up as worship because how I work reflects on the God that I serve. Does that make sense? So how you work, the way you work, it matters. The ability that you have to work is from God. To look at, uh, turn to First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles 29 and verse 11. So they're building the temple. Israel is, and David, he prays this prayer. First Chronicles 29, verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. So David's saying all this is about who? God, it's about your glory. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Verse 12. Both riches and honor come from who? It comes from God. Isn't that what it says? And you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might. And it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen who? Everyone or all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. If you have the health and you have the ability to work, it's a gift from God. And, and so as I'm working and realizing that I have a job, that I can physically do labor, that that is a gift that God has given me. And he says here, we praise your glorious name. They reflected what God had given them and the ability to do what they were doing as a gift from God. And they, they directed it to praise to him. Not like, wow, I'm pretty good. Look what I've done. I got a promotion. I am really good. Aren't I great? You know, look what I've done. Go around telling everybody, look what I've done. 
Now, what David's doing here is he's reflecting that and saying he's praising God. And he's taking, telling Israel, reflect all of what you have within you because of what we're able to do and direct that up to the glory of God. Because God has given you the ability to do that. And, and so this morning, as you think about your job, even if you don't like your job, the fact that you have one and the ability to do it is a gift from God. Right? I mean, we could be paralyzed and not able to work, right? And then it would be like, boy, I wish I could work. Do you see that your health is a gift from God? And your mind, to have the mind, to be able to work, that is a gift from God. And notice here that not only is the ability to work, the accomplishment of work is God's will and plan. Isn't that what it says? And if you're still there in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 14, he says, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from who? From you, God. And from your hand we have given you. All that they were given to God, they realized God had given it to them and they're giving it back. They're just stewards, right? Everything you own is not yours. It's God's. Your car, your house, whatever, it belongs to the Lord. And, and he goes on, For we are sojourners before you and tenants as our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no hope. He goes like what Solomon said, Life is vanity. It, it all ends. But then he, verse 16, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name, it is from your hand, and all is yours. You see the difference that makes in how we approach our work and how we approach the things that we do, whether it's taking care of your yard or helping a neighbor or doing something in the church or me preaching. I mean, if I just walked up here and just said, well, let's open the Bible and, uh, you know, okay, we'll start here. And I didn't prepare. Or, one, you wouldn't like that. But two, I'm accountable to him. Not just the preacher, but all of us in everything that we do. And what we have and the, the, the talents, the abilities, the finances, everything you have, God has given to you. That's what David says, right? It's from you, and now we're giving it back to you as worship. And so whether you like your job or not, whether you're struggling in your work or not, the focus is not, is this the best thing that I like to do? But the focus is, God has given me the ability. He's given me these things, and I want to worship him with them. And that makes all the difference. Because note, my last point is, the satisfaction and the fruit of work is knowing that our work is eternal. Matthew, turn with me to Matthew 6. And this is our last passage. Matthew 6, verse 19. So we see that the focus and the way we work should be to glorify God. The ability and the accomplishment to work is from God. But how many of you have ever built something? Anybody ever built anything? When you were done, did you go, man, I just, and it, and it looked good, right? And it's done well. And you just go, oh, I hated that. I'm so, I'm so mad that I did that. I mean, when you build something, you're like, there's accomplishment there, right? Or if, if you're in sports and you, you know, you, you win a game or you, you get better at a sport, you accomplish something. There's a satisfaction there, isn't it? Where does that come from? It comes from God. You, you see, we are made in the image of God and work, the, the, uh, the ability, the desire to work comes from Him. And, and so the satisfaction of working and accomplishing something and having satisfaction in that, in that is from God. Isn't that what God did after he created the universe? Didn't he sit back on day seven and go, this is good, right? So that comes from God. Now, we've twisted it, made it about us, but it's from him. 
And he gives us satisfaction. But as a believer, I want to show you something that should take your satisfaction to a whole new level. Look at Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not store up your, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what Jesus says is your heart will always follow your money. Where you spend your money, where the focus of your money, your income is from your work, that's where your heart will follow. It will follow that every time. You spend your time, you spend your money, your heart will follow that. That's what he's saying. And so he's saying because of that, when you labor in the things that you get and the things you have, realizing they're for, from God, don't focus them on yourself and me and what I get. Focus them on what's eternal. And then he goes in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For he will hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in what? Wealth, money, mammon, which means just wealth. We work and we get income. We get wages, right? Yeah. If you work at McDonald's, you get a wage. Wherever you work, you get a wage for that. Jesus is saying, if you serve your wage, then all of that is earthly and it's vanity, like what Solomon said. Does that make sense? It's all earthly focused. It has no eternal value. But if you can take that same wage that you earn, and yes, we pay bills and, and go on vacation and there's nothing wrong with those things, but, but the focus of our wealth, our abilities, our job, our health is about praising and worshiping God and we want to, to focus those on what's eternal then we are storing up treasure in heaven that cannot be taken away from us. And what's eternal? The glory of God the souls of men and the word of God. And so when we invest in people when we invest in people coming to Christ or we invest in people growing in the Lord or we're loving the poor and we are building bridges to those who don't have because we have the love of Christ within us when we are investing in the word of God and what brings God glory those things we're storing up treasure in heaven and when you get there it'll be there that's what the Bible says there's reward in heaven that's why this whole thing of everybody has equal opportunity and ends at the same place, that's not biblical. God rewards those who work hard. He does. That's what it says in the scriptures. There's reward in heaven for those who have labored on the earth. The hash mark between the two dates, it matters to God because God expects you to use that hash mark those days as worship to him and to, to focus your life on what's eternal. So I can have abilities. I can have a vehicle. I can have a vacation. I can have things, but do those things, do I take them and focus them on him and what's eternal, or is it all about me? Does that make, you see the difference in that? Oh, I'm getting this because I need this, and this is about me, and this will give me more status, and people will think better of me if I have all of these things. And it doesn't matter what sport, it doesn't matter what hobby you go into in America. You can spend as much money as you want to, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. And so am I doing this because this makes me feel good and, and this gives me status and satisfaction that I have a bunch of stuff? Or do I see the things that God has given me as a gift from him and I'm a steward in whatever he's given me? Whether it's a lot or whether it's nothing, hardly anything, I'm going to take that and focus it on what's eternal and what pleases him. And then what Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That verse is about being content whether you have a little or whether you have a lot. However God has given you, whatever you have, that we are content because of Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I take those things and I use them as an object of worship to God, not as an object to worship myself. Does that make sense? So are you wasting your work? Are you using your job and your abilities to serve God out of gratitude because of what he's done for you? 
Are you wasting all that God's given you by focusing it on yourself? Don't waste your work. Don't waste what God's given you. Because the hash mark matters. And I promise you, and you can bank on it, you can, when, you, when we see each other in glory, you can call me on it. You will not regret giving God anything as worship. When you take all that he's given you and you focus it to honor and glorify him and to please him, I promise you, you will never regret that when you stand before him face to face. You will rejoice that you lived your life in worship. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace in our lives. God, thank you for the ability to work. And God, that, that we can even have satisfaction in that. And God, you've given us so much. And I just pray for all of us, Lord, myself included, that we'll take everything and give our lives to you as worship. In Jesus' name, amen.